Welcome to Resounding, a podcast exploring the power of the arts in advocacy and in action. We talk with artists and activists, taking a deep dive into questions surrounding the causes of displacement, the strength and the vulnerability of people on the move, and the potential of the arts to shine a light on social injustice and impact people's lives for the better. In this episode, I spoke to Alana Francis de Govaya, the Chief Programme and Experience Officer at the Africa Centre in New York City. We discussed how the centre uses culture and events to help shift the global narratives of African identity. Home isn't just where we're from. It's the sounds that move us. The stories that shape us. And the flavors that heal us. It's the communities that connect us. The ones that hold us down. The ones that raise us up. Home is a feeling we all know. So if you're looking for it, you can always find it here. The Africa Center. Home is here. Uh, It's wonderful today to be joined by Alana Francis de Govaya, uh, who is the Chief Program and Experience Officer from the Africa Center. Alana, great to have you with us. Wonderful to be here, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. I wonder if to begin with, you could just uh, explain a little bit about the Africa Center so that all of our listeners understand exactly uh, where it is that you're working. Sure. Um, So the Africa Center is located in Harlem, New York, around the corner of 110th and 5th Avenue. Um, and which is known as Museum Miles. So for those of you who are familiar with New York, that's where the Met Museum is and the Guggenheim Museum and the Jewish Museum is. So at the top of the mile at a really interesting geographic place in New York City, um, where, you know, Harlem, which is is known as kind of the cultural center of, of the Black experience in America in many ways, Um, It's also home to more recent um, African immigrants. Um, And we're also considered to be in East Harlem, which is um, a Latinx community, where obviously there's a lot of people of African descent um, who who live there as well. So it's, and we're on this Museum Mile, which is a cultural kind of Mecca and and well-known road, Fifth Avenue is well-known in in New York City. um, we're essentially an institution that came out of the Museum of African Art in, ni- in 1984. So uh, we like to say that we're a startup with, with a long history <laughs> um, because um, we morphed into a multidisciplinary space after a kind of strategic plan about what does New York City need um, and what kind of unique um, place we could and role we could fill in New York City. Um, And so about 10 years ago, we transformed our mission to be broader than just art because there's so many fantastic um, institutions in New York City that focus on art to really be be broader and focus on culture more broadly, um, business and policy. Um, And about four years ago now, our CEO, Zodinma Iwala, who's a writer, he wrote Beast of No Nation. He's also a medical doctor. Um, He's also a filmmaker, so a really um, person who could bring a lot of um, kind of vision to this multidisciplinary space in New York, um, really started and we decided to focus on really transforming narratives around people of African descent. And so we have a 70,000 square foot space, which those of you who are not American, that's 70,000 square (laughs) meters. Um, We also spell our name ER, I joke often that, you know, African spell center. R-E, Africans who speak spell English, so it's with center E-R. Um, so yeah, 7,000 square meters, 70,000 square foot space on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 110. So we have a physical space um, that we're really building out in phases. Um, and so our first phase opened um, in January of 2019. And in that first space, 
Uh, we have a fast, casual dining concept led by Chef Pierre Tiam, who's a Senegalese chef. And we really wanted to start with, a, with, with food because food is such an entry point in terms of culture and really bring people in um, to, to the Africa Center through food um, and to build community. And so in that first space, we've had theater performances, we've had musical performances, we've had art exhibitions, um, and we've also activated um, the plaza surrounding the Africa Center uh, with, with art and kind of community days. And with COVID, we really shifted into the virtual space, space which is something we always wanted to do um, because we're called the Africa Center and we're based in New York City, but the African diaspora is global. It's obviously important for any diaspora to be connected to the region of the world um, where their origins are rooted in. So you know, having this digital programming that we started uh, and really pushed to start during COVID has really helped us to connect and be mm -hmm. more global and really bring bring our work beyond uh, our physical space in New York City. Yeah. You, you talked there about one of your missions being to transform narratives. Yeah. Your, your website talks about transforming the world's understanding of Africa, its diaspora, and the role of people of African descent mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So really uh, ambitious, big statement. And, and if I think of narrative, that's lots of narratives, actually, you're looking to redress. Um, and as you said, from, from the location that you're in, which has its own narrative and, and which has its own remarkable history. Can you can you talk a bit about that? What you what you mean by the narr which narratives exist even um, from your perspective and which ones you, you, you think you can influence and want to influence? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think, you know, at the very core of narrative, we're really focused on centering Africans. And when we say Africans, we mean all people of, of, of African descent. So I, for example, am Caribbean. And so, you know, we mean we, we mean African Americans. And I think the issue has been that narratives that do exist have not been told by people of African descent and they have not centered us. And so, and they have been very like monolithic <laughs> in many ways. And, you know, I think that is the, that is what we're trying to, to, to change is to make sure that narratives that we, we do elevate because we really see ourselves as a platform because as you mentioned that 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 mission is extremely ambitious and so we don't see ourselves doing that alone so just to start in terms of of breaking it down to answer your question you know the first and most core important thing to us is that any narrative that we choose to address is one that is going to be told by someone who's of African descent it's going to amplify the nuance and complexity that exists among people of African descent and the diversity. So, for example, recently we had a, a seminar with the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard about African diversity um, because Africa is one of the most genetically diverse um, continents in the world. So someone in Ethiopia is more genetically diverse than someone in Senegal versus someone in Ethiopia and someone in, in the United Kingdom, for example. Um, however, narratives that exist are that, you know, Black people, Africans were all the same, um, and there's not specificity or diversity within within us, you know, um, which, you know, that also makes it complicated in terms of what is Pan-Africanism, you know, in terms of, of um, you know, not being one thing, you know, mm -hmm. Black people and people of African descent were not one thing. And so I think just to, to answer your question, that is really what we're, we're, we're trying to, to kind of change is the notion and the mythology that people of African are the same, uh, African descent are the same, that uh, we are just receivers of, <laughs> of, of knowledge and experience. And uh, we are not, you know, contributors to, to experience and expertise. You know, we're not just consumers and receivers, we're also contributors. And so there's a variety of ways, obviously, we have to, we have to contribute to that, um, mm -hmm. that notion. Yeah. So, so con controlling and influencing the narrative is, is a, is a yeah. big first step. Well, a, a, the central step, in fact. So, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, just to add to what I was saying, you know, one of the things about centering Africans is that in terms of our mission, you know, who are we talking to and who is our audience? You know, that, that always becomes the notion because, and what type of, what narratives are we changing? I think our center is people of African descent. That is our center because, because we're diverse, you know, at first, 
you know, we have a lot of narratives about each other that are destructive and, and keep us apart from each other. And so mm -hmm. it's also important to us to make sure that the variety of people of African descent, that we understand more about each other, about our differences, about our specificity, and that there's knowledge, um, you know, someone who's African American who is in New York is very different from someone who's, who, you know, who, you know, who has multiple identities is very different from someone who's on the African continent, you know, and so yeah. just making sure that within people of African descent that are, we understand our diversity and our complexity and the, the, the elements that bind us together, as well as, as, as the things that make us different from each other. So as a center, that means you're, you're trying to reach a, an enormous number of people in, and by definition in, in a lot of different ways, because people would respond to different kinds of programming, exactly. um, depending on who they are. Exactly. And if I look at your, your program there, you've got wine tasting alongside evenings of discussion, alongside advice for people that need immigration advice. Um, you've got the, the, the food um, premises, as you explained before, to get people coming into the building and living in the building. How, how are you finding people respond to that? Because it, it, do, do people find their place within the center? Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, we, we, are, we are a startup in many ways. And so right. I think that, you know, our first kind of strategy when we started was to do as much as possible. Um, and to right. reach as many people as possible because yeah. we do have many audiences, right? Our focus, yeah. our core is obviously people of African descent, but people who are not of African descent have a lot to learn. And that's part of the narrative transformation. Right. And the Africa Center is for everybody. Um, and um, I think that one of the things we've, we've tried to do is really focus our, our kind of core areas as we're building, you know, we're, we're as I said, we're like right now, we're trying to go through a process of a theory of change and really think through our outcomes and what type of, you know, that core work that an institution needs to do as they're building. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're at the nascent stages of that. But in terms of, of your question, one of the things that we do is we really, you know, we had this audience survey, for example, about uh, that we did with the American Alliance of Museums. And we asked specific questions, getting to your very question about, you know, how are people responding and people want more, you know, so because we're the only cultural institution in um, the United States that really focuces on Africa and um, in this disciplinary way. Right. So, so such an amazing thing to hear as a statement. Yeah. So I think, you know, people want more. Um, I think they definitely want us to focus a lot more on, on children. We haven't, you know, we okay. have a lot of work to do in terms of focusing on, on kids. And that's really aligned with the transforming narratives in many ways, you know, focusing on younger people um, when they're developing their sense of identity and their, their understanding of the world. Um, I think mm -hmm. that's a place where we can have a lot more impact you know, one of the things we we also um, are hearing is just this need to 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 reach the the people who are directly surrounding the Africa Center because I think there's been a shift in many ways um, during COVID to virtual programming, which can get a bit elitist in many ways um, because who has um, internet access? We have to make sure that we're balancing including people in, in the work we do, even in, the, in this kind of digital in between. That's, again, amazing statement to hear, thinking of New York, that the internet was meant to be the great equalizer, that that's equal access. Yeah. But in fact, your experience is very different. Yeah, very, very different. Yeah, def very different. And so that's why we've tried to really activate the plaza surrounding the Africa Center. I remember um, a young woman who's actually on an advisory board for a, an exhibition that we're, we're working on. She's a young um, woman of West African descent, and she said that she saw this sign, the Africa Center, and she never thought it was for her. You know, right. so, so, so really trying to make sure that we're engaging our community that's that's directly around us and yeah. you know it's complicated because we have so many audiences um yeah. because we're having you know high level discussions with very established um you know donors of ours but then also we want to make sure that you know young young girls in the community who really feel like the africa center is ours because you know when we have exhibitions who's coming to them um and who's accessing the programs and the exhibitions that we put on You 
know, I used to I used to spend a lot of time in that area of New York, uh, so I, c- I can picture very clearly where the center is. And if I, from outside, think of the narratives connected to that neighborhood and to the people that live in that neighborhood, they would be primarily about quite limited opportunities. Yeah. Well, it's um, interesting you should say that, Chris, because gentrification is live and kicking in Harlem. So, right. <laughs> so it's know, changed. So it's changed considerably. And, right. You know, that's something that also is, is we're thinking about because people hear Harlem and they think of Harlem, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but it's very much, you know, we have a luxury condo building that's attached to the Africa Center. You know, right. that's very different from this person I'm describing. So it's a it's a changing neighborhood. It's mm-hmm. a diverse neighborhood that also includes affluent people of African descent um, mm-hmm. who are also super important to us. And so so it's that, you know, fluidity that we have to have and the the, the constant thought about the various communities we have, because it gets back to what I was talking before about the diversity that exists uh, between people of African descent and, and how that's, you know, something that we take very seriously, but it's also very complicated in terms of your audience and who you're targeting. Yeah. Bringing it to, to music, which is obviously the, the area that I know most of. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I know outside your building, you have that, I, I guess it's still there, the Duke Ellington statue. Yes. And I, I always think of that neighborhood. You have Tito Puente way uh, just across. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and musically, it's it. There's a lot connected to that neighborhood. I don't know. I don't know the history, so I don't know how true it all is. But certainly, from my perspective, it was a coming together of different styles of music and emerging. And creatively, uh, I imagine it all being very rich. It's a very simplified image I have of it. I'm sure, but musicians from different backgrounds coming together, playing together, and you have Latin jazz as yeah. kind of coming out of that, that exact kind of geographical location for sure. Not as simple as that, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but there's an image there, but, but again, that's, that's one narrative of course. So I'm interested how you, how you embrace su- such creative outcomes, but also, I, d- I don't know, sometimes those can also be quite limiting in the way people see a neighborhood or see a community or, or see a group of people. That means jazz. That means Latin jazz. It's not, again, it's it's one story, isn't it? And one story of success, which is very easy to palate. It's very easy to kind of understand. It's a positive outcome yeah. um, of, of very not positive stories often. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do you manage that kind of complexity? Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, we try to do is talk about it. So instead, you know, so, you know, what you're saying is is interesting because I was speaking to someone who's lived in the neighborhood for a very long time, who's Puerto Rican of African descent. And she was telling me that before, you know, there were many things on the, the physical space where the Africa Center is. And one of the things was people used to play and just have jam sessions like on the roof of the building that used to be there. Right. And we used to really be a gathering place. And we were saying that when we have we, one of the programs we should do is just really giving homage to that history and to that space. And um, music and food for me are the two things that, that bring together people of African descent that are beyond our struggle, you know, because often we're talking about oppression and the things that bind us together, colonialism, racism, you know, but, but the things like music and culture, you can hear those <laughs> those remnants of mm-hmm. um, how we're connected and how um, you know traditions have been brought across uh, the Atlantic Ocean um, and are you know remnant in salsa and bachata and hip hop and you know all the the elements of music. So um, I think one of the things that we try to do is really contextualize it and talk about um, how specifically. Um, those those traditions uh, that are rooted in Africa continue through various forms of music and how one thing I didn't mention is that we're really focused on contemporary Africa, but how they really are reflected today. Mm-hmm. And so um, music is, is, is totally a wonderful way of doing that. And, we, you know, we've had several music performance. We have a wonderful relationship with Somi, who I know you're familiar with, um, and her Salon Africana and really highlighting um, contemporary Africans who are really pushing the envelope and what it means to, to be a musician and African. Mm-hmm. Amazing people like Njuzo Makatini and Tandiswa Mazwai and Zoe Motiga. So, yeah. So so are you are you working as a venue by going and finding the artists and, and the artistic products or artistic processes which, which speak to your mission or, or are you more responsive and open doors to people to come with their ideas? 
So that's exactly um, how we're, tr- so one of the things we're trying to do, because we're really building an institution. I mean, mm-hmm. we have this long history, but we're really starting and trying to build. Um, and so, you know, the bottom line is we have a lot more questions than answers in terms <laughs> of how we're doing that. But one of the things that uh, we're very intentional about is being in the type of institution that is is focused on people and co- like co-creation, collaboration, mm-hmm. um, and really creating programs and exhibitions in partnership with other people because we're a very small team and there's no way that, you know, all of us are going to have expertise in the variety of areas where we need to focus. So we really work with um, musicians, artists, um, poets, policy experts to really co-collaborate and co-create. So that's the way we work with musicians is that Mm -hmm. we, we seek out musicians and Somi, for example, on her initiative Salon Africana, um, we we kind of brainstorm ideas of what what we what could be possible, um, and then we really work with specific artists to tap into their network so that we can have mutually beneficial programs yeah. and exhibitions. So it's not just about the Africa Center um, elevating our own platform and our needs, but we're really elevating the the needs and the platform of of artists and musicians so that they they see an advantage in working with us, and it's not just a an extractive. Um, yeah. relationship which you know obviously a lot of institutions have been criticized for extracting a lot from artists but we're, we're trying to to really have long-lasting relationships also and not just really do things that are one-off and that are really mutually uh, beneficial it, it makes me think of a previous podcast we did with a with a, a spoken word artist called Zena Edwards um, she was saying that um, she felt that there was this notion of black art in Britain where, where she was there was an expectation of struggle art and that's what was valued. So, so artists were often faced with institutions that would value a certain kind of artistic uh, output. I'm paraphrasing, but she said something like, well, if I want to paint a flower, why can't I paint a flower? Exactly. You know, why can't I just paint something beautiful? Why, why is this other? It's narrative again, of course. It, her art was meant to fit the narrative of what somebody was doing by hosting her performance, in effect. Yeah. yeah. She, she was expected to kind of play along with this bigger narrative. Yeah. So to have institutions which are just coming at that differently, is, it's got to be so important. Yeah. Um, and of course, it fits the mission of the Africa Centre, but it sounds like something that should be much more widely adopted as a way of working across yeah. all artists, rather than limiting what's meant to, meant to be the output. Yeah, yeah. And it's this expectation that because you're you're African or because you're black, you're supposed to you're supposed to create something in a certain way. And and you know, for some reason when you when you were telling me this, I remembered that one of the panelists in the wine program was mm. was talking about it's fascinating to that that he said that chocolate is not Swiss, coffee is not Italian, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we, we, the narrative is that they are, you know, the, the cocoa comes from Ghana and coffee beans, you know, come from Kenya and other parts of, of the African continent. Yet there's a there's a mainstream like it's almost it's mythology, but it's been created that these things are are, are European. Yeah. Uh, and so his point was in the context of wine is that even though wine cannot grow um, in most of the African continent, why can't there be a narrative about African wine, you know, because of course there can be African wine, even if it doesn't grow on the continent, because Europeans have been doing that from the beginning of, of time. And so it's those types of points that really change our mindset and what are we believe to be true, the truth, the absolute yeah. truth um, that we're trying to really bring, bring, be a platform for. So people can start thinking more critically about what we hold to be, to be the truth. Honestly, I am I am more revolutionary than I need to be. I think that <laughs> you know because Go for you know, it. it's hard to it's hard to be revolutionary when you have to work like you have to raise funds, you have to exist in the current status quo to function, but you know, I think it's important if you're trying to change the world to kind of have to reimagine things and to kind of create new models of existing. And I think that that is really fundamental. I'm not convinced that if things stay the same and in the same same way that really we're going to change very much, you know. And so 
I, I am not well positioned to advise anyone necessarily on what they should do. But I mean, I will say that I think that kind of we really are in dire needs of shaking things up and creating new systems. I mean, there are, you know, very mo- various models of leadership, you know, co-leadership. I mean, it's kind of basic making sure that, you know, if you're a white British in a white British organization, who's in leadership positions and who's calling the shots and who has the power, um, who's being listened to, you know, I mean, I think people really need to be critical of what they're doing, including at the Africa Center, because as I said, we were, you know, we also are trying to be critical of ourselves and really make sure that, you know, just because we're a black led organization doesn't mean we also have to really push ourselves to address systemic racism yeah. and inequality and classism yeah. and elitism. I mean, we, you know, it's not just others, it's also ourselves. And I think we really just need new models of working. And I think it's it's up to all of us to make sure that that, that happens. And I mean, obviously, the more powerful you are, the more pressure you should put on yourselves to, <laughs> to, to make sure that that happens. So yeah, yeah. it's skilled, isn't it? That's a, that's a skilled process. I've, I've been in situations before where I've, I've seen someone kind of really make an effort to, to, to step aside from their power, to, to work differently. And nine times out of 10, someone else has just stepped in and, and taken the power. It can be. It can leave a vacuum. It can lead. It can leave um, an opportunity somehow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so to navigate that is 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 not simple. It's not simple at all. You know, I think it's it's not simple, but then it's it's also a little bit basic. You know, it's like you know, at the same time. I mean, it's really. I think uh, getting back to my point, I was making earlier about yeah. relationships. You know, and and having relationships that are that are mutually beneficial. You know, and it's like respect and understanding, which are just, you know, they sound wishy-washy, but it's, it's really at its essence that what it is, you know, and I think, you know, giving up control and power, it's complicated, but it's also simple. Yeah. In our last podcast, we spoke to Victoria Burns, who, who's from an organization called Culture Declares Emergency, which is the climate emergency is what they're declaring um, and, and calling on cultural institutions to do the same. And she spoke very much the same way, that it requires a huge shift in the way people operate. To, to think that the same structures that are causing global destruction are also going to be the structures which can find the solution or, or magically morph into the solution is, is just misled. It's, it's the same as you're saying, isn't it, that there's another structure needed. There's another way of working needed. It's not just, okay, the same structures will adapt and everything will be fine. Everything will be redressed. It, it's, it's different from that, what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and again, coming back to R27, I, I have a hope that artists are open to that, that, that the arts should be creative thinking enough to imagine a different way of working that should be receptive to break down structures, should be of that mindset. Not sure it's always true, though, right. because there's equally an institution, there's equally money, there's equally power. Yeah. So, so for all of our audience who, who are inspired to, to follow the, the Africa Center, how can we follow you? Um, people that are in America, people that are in Europe? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. So the first thing um, you can do is you can follow us on social media at the Africa Center, spelled E-R, the American (laughs) way, because there is an Africa Center in London. But um, uh, make sure you're following us on social media. You can also sign up for our newsletter, which will keep you up to date of all of our programs and our initiatives. And uh, finally, you know, we're working in collaboration with the Museum of Food and Drink on an exhibition called African slash American Making Nations Table. And that exhibition really gets at um, how, you know, the connections between the African continent and um, and the U.S. And it's curated by Jessica B. Harris, who wrote a book called High on the Hog. You may have seen the Netflix uh, special, which is a series about um, the the about African American food. The exhibition is actually um, based on on that book as well, and Jessica B. Harris curates the exhibition, and so it really brings together our three areas of business, policy, and culture. And we're thrilled to be collaborating with the Museum of Drink, of Food and Drink, on the exhibition. It was supposed to open its COVID hit. Um, and unfortunately, we've had to postpone it, but it um, stay tuned for more announcements of when it, it will open, but it most likely will open in the first quarter of next year. So um, keep keep up to date with us on social media. And our website is, is the Africa Center, er.org. Uh, thanks. This has been a pleasure. Lovely to, to talk no to you. Lovely to catch up.
Yeah, lovely to speak to you too, Chris, and, and thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Resounding is brought to you by the Art27 Network, a network of like-minded initiatives using art and culture to respond to the ongoing crisis of displacement of human beings in Europe and around the world. To find out more and to join our growing network, you can visit our website, art27.art, or follow us on Facebook at Art27. This podcast was produced and edited by Ed Holland. The theme tune was written by Matteo Galesi in collaboration with Sinker. Thank you for listening. <laughs>